Good afternoon. Welcome to our briefing. I'd like to uh, welcome the students uh, of journalism from American University here who've come to watch the uh, hardest working, most astute press corps in Washington uh, fire questions at me. And I'm ready to take the questions. Charlie? Um, uh, how about the, the talks between Taiwan uh, and the United States going on, on the arms talks? Uh, what is Taiwan asking for? including, is it asking for submarines? And would the United States be any more inclined to give submarines this year than they did last year when they refused? Well, as you correctly point out, they've asked uh, for submarines in the past. Um, as a, uh, a veteran uh, of covering these talks, you also know that we don't uh, discuss the details of the talks. Um, they're supposed to be private talks between Taiwan and the United States, and I'm going to respect that. Um, that rule here. Are these are official talks or unofficial talks? These are annual talks that um, <coughs> uh, uh, are the primary way for us and uh, uh, Taiwan to uh, exchange views. Uh, they've been going on for years. Steve. Would, would the uh, administration be more inclined to uh, give them what they want, given the current threats from mainland China? Well, we always review what they ask for, um, and uh, uh, we will this year. I, I might point out that uh, in the past, we have approved some of their requests, and they have not then acted on, uh, on the requests. So there's, uh, <coughs> there's a sort of a three-stage process here. The first is what request do they make, two, how do we respond to their request, and three, um, even if we approve, uh, the purchase of certain equipment, um, do they then go ahead and buy it? They're constantly recalibrating their uh, defense plans uh, in light of uh, in light of the uh, their own strategic assessment. So, when are they uh, scheduled to get the F-16s that they've had on order for some time? I believe the first um, uh, F-16s are supposed to be delivered um, next year. There are 150 in all. Um, I may have the, uh, the list here. We announced all this. You can get that from DDI. We announced all this last week, as a matter of fact. There's a very extensive list of equipment that's been already approved for sale to uh, Taiwan. To revisit Steve's question, is the situation involving the tension with China now likely to have any bearing on the United States decision on requests by, by Taiwan? Well, the Chinese weigh their strategic situation. They make their request, and we also weigh their defensive needs when we make our decisions. Um, so yes, that that plays a part in in what our decisions are, but um, uh, a number of other elements play a part in what our decisions are. Uh, how does it fit into our arms sale posture generally? Um, uh, are we prepared to make available to them technology that we're, we may not have made available yet to other countries? There are a number of considerations that we have to work through in response to every request. Is, is one of the considerations the fact that the United States only officially recognizes Beijing as a government of, of China and not Taiwan? Would that well, it? there are a number of considerations. We are committed under the Taiwan Relations Act to uh, uh, to help Taiwan uh, defend itself, and uh, that's one of the one of the goals of our of our arms sales policy to them. Is it is it the, the Pentagon's assessment at this point that Taiwan is capable of defending itself today from uh, the current capability that China has? Well, first of all, um, the Chinese have made it very plain that um, their policy toward Taiwan has not changed, and that policy is to seek a, a, a peaceful reunification. We do not expect that Taiwan will face a need to defend itself. Um, we expect that uh, China and Taiwan will both continue their policies geared toward peaceful uh, reunification. But, but, but does Ch Taiwan, with the arms it has today, uh, is, is it capable of defending itself against China's current military? Is there a balance of power there? It could defend itself against uh, certain parts of China's military capability. Um, Secretary Perry has said, and uh, General Shalikashvili, I believe as well, has said, for instance, that China doesn't have the ability to launch an amphibious attack against, uh, against Taiwan. 
um, so they would be able to defend themselves against an attempted amphibious attack. It's hard to uh, it's hard to seize territory unless it's actually uh, hard to seize an island unless it's actually invaded. So in that regard, I think that Taiwan is in a good position to defend itself. But apparently, one thing that both the Taiwanese and the United States worry about is a possible naval blockade of Taiwan, and that apparently is what Taiwan is asking weapons for uh, to break a naval blockade. We do not anticipate that there will be a naval blockade. As I said earlier, we believe that both China and Taiwan will adhere to their policy of seeking a, a peaceful uh, reunification over time. What about China's warnings to the United States to keep its ships out of the Taiwan Straits? Doesn't that amount to effectively closing an international waterway? And what will the U.S. response be? Well, first of all, we do reserve the right to sail in international waterways, but um, we have not sent our fleets there to provoke anybody. We've sent our fleets there to uh, to reassure um, countries in the region of our interest in uh, in free navigation and our interest in peace in the Western Pacific. We're a naval power, a major naval power in the Western Pacific. We apply the sea lanes there regularly. We've been through the strait in the past. I assume we'll go through the strait in the future. Um, I can't tell you when. So is, is the United States effectively ignoring this warning from the Chinese, or what is the response? Our response is that we reserve the right to uh, go through international waters. And did you say there is a list detailing the military assistance to Taiwan that the U.S. Yes, we put out a list last week, which you can, I don't happen to have it here, but it's a fairly extensive list. That's the DDI for a list before the briefing. It was, I was told there wasn't. Well, we... We issued one last week, and I, if we issued it last week, I think we can issue it again this week. <laughs> there were actually newspaper stories on the list, and uh, uh, there were uh, we got fairly extensive coverage, uh, even in South America, where I was monitoring uh, the coverage of the Pentagon. I saw that it got fairly extensive coverage. John, did you drink the water? Uh, I did not. Do you, uh, but I never drink water when I travel, except bottled water. Can you shed some light, please, on uh, the plans the U.S. government has for the deployment of uh, all the U.S. naval ships around Taiwan for the period after this Saturday, after the elections? Are you going to keep a fairly healthy naval presence uh, around Taiwan until the Chinese exercises are completely over and everything is settled down? Or, uh, we'll keep an appropriate naval presence in the area. And uh, we'll have to decide what is appropriate when we look at the situation after the election. By keeping that naval presence there, does the United States become a de facto protector, even though it has no treaty obligation? Um, as I said, we're not there to, uh, to provoke anyone. Um, we're there to uh, uh, show our interest in peace and stability in, in Asia. We have 100,000 troops stationed in Asia. We have a substantial military presence in Asia. We believe that this military presence has, has helped uh, bring about an era of peace and prosperity throughout all of Asia. And um, we're interested in preserving that. We believe that uh, all the countries in Asia are also interested in preserving that atmosphere of peace and prosperity. Does it make you a de facto protector, or would you, in the event of uh, aggression, just turn tail and leave? We've said that we would. Uh, regard um, we would take any attack against Taiwan very, very seriously. We don't expect that there'll be an attack. We do not expect military action here. Um, the war fever that appears to be evident in the press is not shared in Taiwan. It's not shared in the United States government, nor is it shared in the Chinese government. From all public statements, everybody expects that there'll be a peaceful, that these are military exercises which will end when they're scheduled to end. They will not lead to military action. They're exercises and uh, that uh, China and Taiwan will return to their policies of peaceful reunification. The government in Beijing says that the presence of U.S. ships is provoking them and raising the tension. So they, they say that what you are saying is not so. Well, the government in Beijing is comprised of many people. And um, one of them is Li Peng, uh, who said that it would be that he, that, that, um, that uh, some military action or some movement through the strait could be a complicating factor. Um, 
we have made it very clear that we are not there to provoke people. We have made it very clear that they were not there to complicate the um, to complicate the the situation. We are there to reassure countries in Asia of our interest in peace and stability and prosperity in Asia. It's that simple. Does that mean you're not there? Can I get an answer to the question? Does that mean you're not there as the de facto protector? We are there as the de facto protector of peace and stability in Asia. Yes. Yes, Ken. And there seems to me to, to be an, an impasse here. Uh, China uh, uh, claims. Right here in this room? No, sir. <laughs> no, sir, in this issue. Uh, not, not at all in this room. But in this issue, General, there seems to be an impasse. China claims to be the protector of Taiwan and, and as its sovereign territory. And the United States is uh, also acting as the protector uh, of, of Taiwan. Uh, there seems to be a conflict of interest. And I wonder if there would be some, uh, some solution in possibly joining with China and Taiwan in some, some kind of a trilateral security arrangement, some other approach to this uh, diplomatically. Bill, as you know better than anybody else, um, we adhere to a one-China policy. And um, that's been our policy for years. And part of that policy is that the reunification, any reunification between China and Taiwan will be peaceful. That happens to be the policy of China. It happens to be the policy of Taiwan. We expect that policy to prevail. I don't think there's a need um, for the type of arrangement that you suggested. Um, we expect that when, these, uh, when the elections are over in Taiwan and that when the military exercises end, the uh, Chinese troops will return to their barracks and uh, over a period of time, China and Taiwan will be able to reestablish the type of dialogue they've had um, over the last few years. It's a dialogue that's not only included um, uh, uh, diplomacy, but it's also included a considerable amount of, uh, of, uh, of economic contact. And we assume that that will continue to the mutual benefit of both China and Taiwan. Is there an issue here of face or saving of face with regard to the PLA uh, uh, and the United States uh, military show in, in, the, in the area? Do you think? I, I guess I don't understand that question. Well, uh, hmm. I'm not sure I can ex explain it, except that there may, there may be an affront uh, in that the Chinese military uh, believes that they are the protector of Taiwan and the United States is butting in. Is this, is this uh, perceived uh, to, to be a, a real mindset in, uh, of the PLA? I'm, I don't accept the characterization that we're butting in. We. Um, uh, have a substantial naval presence in the Western Pacific. We've had it there for years. We will have it there for years to come. Um, we regard it as essential to maintaining peace and stability in the area. That's our interest, and we'll continue to pursue that interest. I don't consider that butting in. Has the Chinese Defense Minister come in? The Chinese Defense Minister um, is uh, uh, scheduled to come um, uh, sometime in April, and we're currently uh, reviewing the, uh, uh, reviewing the uh, format for the meeting. Mike, you need a schedule to come. The Chinese said he is coming in April. The, uh, the current schedule is that he's, he's to come in April. Ken, if, uh, if the U.S. government is so confident that after this exercise everyone will return to barracks and that it's really just the, it's just the press that's beating the drums here, uh, why is the U.S having two carrier task forces float around in those First waters. of all, I didn't say it was just the press that's beating the, the drums here. I've said that the, uh, uh, the press seems to be... Fever is in the press <laughs> not shared by the governments of Taiwan, U.S., or Beijing. Why are we sending two carrier task forces? Uh, we, we have sent our carriers there to uh, uh, maintain stability in the area. We are interested in stability in the area. That's why we have a substantial military presence in Asia. And um, that's why we've sent our carriers there. With the goal of maintaining stability and peace and security in the area, is there any overriding need this week to sail through the Taiwan Straits? Considering that you say that you're not there to provoke anybody. Thank you. Um, I, I haven't, look, I've, what I've said is that we, um, uh, we reserve the right to sail in international waters. Um, 
whether or not we sail through the Strait of Taiwan has not been decided. But it's not necessary to maintain that presence. I'm not. Uh, our, our presence is clear from the uh, from the carriers. Carriers are are uh, a big presence. They're hard to miss. Steve, change of topic. Yeah. Sure. Just uh, can change. you just, just a straightforward question? Can you tell us at this point <laughs> when? What do you the, think mine was? <laughs> this was a loaded question. This is an unloaded question. Um, when is the Nimitz now scheduled to arrive on station in the waters of Taiwan? And can you tell us whether it's scheduled to take a port call? after it arrives? Um, I am not positive uh, exactly when it will. it is scheduled to arrive in the area. Um, it will be um, uh, around this weekend, but I'll try to get a more precise date. Before the election? I, s I will try to get a precise date. And do you know if it's scheduled to take a port visit in the region while it's there? Uh, my understanding is it is, yes. Do you know where? Um, I don't know right now where. I don't. On the subject of uh, light reading, when will the P1R1s be available? Do you know? As soon as they're printed. <laughs> we had said earlier that by the end of this month, and I think that um, we'll adhere to that. And I've just been told by, uh, by Colonel Kennett that the Nimitz is expected to arrive on the 23rd or the 24th of March in the area. Of Taiwan. Ken, David. Ken today's uh, D plus 90 in Bosnia. What's the Pentagon's assessment of whether or not the goals are being met? Um, we think that generally the military part of the, uh, of the operation has gone extremely well. Uh, we went there, as you know, uh, prepared for a very uh, well prepared for a very tough operation. And the training has paid off. We've been able to separate the forces. Um, we've been able to um, uh, uh, avoid. Um, we've been able to perform well in, a, in an area that's heavily mined. Um, we have uh, basically succeeded in separating the warring parties. We've succeeded in uh, getting the uh, tra certain uh, territory transferred that was. Uh, uh, called to be transferred under the Dayton Agreement. Today, D plus 90 is the day that um, the transferred territory is being turned over to the other sides. We protected that territory for 45 days without incident. Um, there, we, uh, Sarajevo has been, uh, uh, the, the transfer of areas in and around Sarajevo have taken place. Um, we feel that the mission has gone, uh, is going quite well. It's not over, however. It's very important that the second part of the mission, the broader part of the mission, which is civilian reconstruction, begin. And that has been somewhat slower in getting off the ground than the military part of the mission. It's not surprising when you think about it, because NATO moved in with an established chain of command with forces that were um, uh, trained and well prepared for the job they were undertaking, whereas the civilian reconstruction side has had to be built from nothing. And uh, that's what's happening now. The UN, uh, the UN spokesman there is saying that what's happening with the turnover of the suburbs uh, of Sarajevo, to call that a success would be silly. Um, do you think that what's happening with the turnover, the uh, the looting, the arson, the arson, the exodus. Uh, you call this a success? I call the separation of forces a success. I call the um, uh, the uh, the the willingness of all sides to uh, adhere to uh, uh, relatively peaceful conditions through the separation of forces a success. I think it's clear that all sides want peace, and that's um, that's very helpful. That's and, and also somewhat hopeful for the future. Obviously, what's happened in the suburbs of Sarajevo has, uh, has been terrible. Um, but it illustrates the fact that we've all known from the beginning here that um, uh, after a long and bitter war, healing does not come quickly. There's a suspicion, and that suspicion will continue for some time. 
and yet wasn't the military supposed to, supposed to establish a, quote, secure atmosphere, unquote, uh, and, and to prevent thugs and hooligans from, from running the, the service who even wanted to stay in the suburbs of Fario from running them out. Well, as I understand it, as I understand it, there, there uh, are still about 11,000 Serbs in the suburbs of, of, I think there were about 40,000 there in total. Um, I'll have to check those numbers. But there still are some Serbs in the area who have chosen to stay. Um, I-4 has said from the beginning that it's not a police force. Um, we have been trying to support the police, but it's very difficult to deal in a situation uh, uh, to deal with arsonists and, uh, and others who are determined to destroy property. We can't protect every building in the Sarajevo suburbs. We've never promised to be able to do that. Steve. Ken, uh, different topic. The uh, uh, Army has finished its study of uh, eight groups within the ranks, and the Secretary of Defense was briefed yesterday on this topic. Is he inclined to have the uh, uh, such a study expanded to include the other services? He was briefed on the study. Um, he and the Army are now um, uh, considering what the next steps will be, and we uh, should have an announcement about that in a couple of days. Can you just tell us whether the, uh, the briefing he was giving indicated there's a serious problem with this in the Army? I think I'll just let them both speak about the study when they come here on Thursday. Yes. Yeah, so one more back to China. Uh, uh, Ken, can the U.S. Navy, the naval forces that are uh, with the uh, independents at the present time, uh, successfully intercept and destroy a Chinese M9 missile? I don't believe that that um, problem will arise. Uh, Ken, last week, uh, Pentagon spokesman standing in for you indicated that the United States had received uh, private assurances that China uh, would not initiate any hostile act against Taiwan. That seemed to go beyond public statements we'd heard before, which simply said that China was uh, favored a peaceful resolution to the crisis. Can you just uh, amplify, clarify, or put that into context about what kind of assurances the United States has received from China about its intentions? Um, authorities in the People's Republic of China have stated publicly, as well as in diplomatic exchanges, that there's no change in their policy. And their policy is a peaceful resolution of the Taiwan question. Based on that, we do not believe that an attack is in the offing, we believe these are exercises and only exercises. And can you also, there's been quite a bit of talk in recent days about a purported threat made by some Chinese officials to, uh, quote, rain nuclear uh, weapons on Los Angeles. Can you put that into any context for us? And un under what was such a statement made, or what was the context for it? The threat, first of all, is ridiculous. Um, I cannot explain why some low-level person in China would do that. We see no reason um, uh, to, uh, to fear an attack from China. And um, uh, uh, China knows what the consequences of any sex action would be. It's just a, it's a ludicrous threat. The uh, U.S.-Taiwan Act says that under a dangerous condition, the administration would consult with Congress. Now, considering the Chinese violent reaction to the second <coughs> task force, what has the administration done in a special way to bring Congress into this? Well, we've kept Congress informed of what we were doing all the way along. Our policy has been very public from the beginning, and we've consulted with Congress. Nothing special. Well. Consulting with Congress is, is informing Congress of what we're doing, uh, discussing it with them. There have been multiple hearings in Congress on our China policy. There's going to be a hearing tomorrow on our China policy. Um, uh, last week, uh, I believe, or the week before, uh, 
uh, Secretary Lord of the State Department was up there with Deputy Secretary Campbell of the Defense Department talking about our China policy. I think there's been uh, adequate consultation about this. Um, uh, in the last week, uh, the last three, two weeks, uh, Secretary Perry and General Shali Kashvili have been uh, have been on the Hill testifying before congressional committees on the budget. There have been ample opportunities to ask some questions about China and Taiwan, and questions have been asked. So I think there's been ample consultation with Congress about this. Thank you.